Could you describe the day-to-day -day life of a monk or nun? Yep, it's a very full day. Um, so, rise at quarter to six. The first meditation is at 6.30. So we meditate in uh, for an hour at a time. Unless it's your particular week to do the breakfast for the community, in which case uh, you, you um, meditate in your own room and then and then go and make breakfast for, for 7.30 after the first meditation. So interspersed with all of this, there are, there are duties and work, work that needs to be carried out. So then there's a 20 minute breakfast period. Um, and then there's a, a, a work routine uh, from 10 to 8 to 8.30. And so that's basic cleaning toilets and sweeping and um, rudimentary sort of household chores, the person doing the, the breakfasts completes the, the kitchen duty, washing everything up. And then um, there are th from that point on at quarter to nine there's another hour meditation, half an hour break at the end of that and there's another meditation from 10.15 to 11.15, then another half hour break and then either somebody's allotted the duty to make the lunches for the community or there's a a further hour meditation at quarter to twelve. Um, so at quarter to one everyone has lunch and then at approximately two o'clock there's a, a four hour work duty and that could be anything that's required uh, for the community. It could be cooking, could be writing a lecture, could be sweeping, doing gardening, could be taking the car out on a some kind of errand whole bunch of different things that it could be. So that takes up to six o'clock. Um, and that's that four hour period is where the the, the community really externalises. So people come in for interviews with the teacher, members of the lay, lay community and people who are interested in coming along to the centre. So sometimes there are little duties like showing people in and mm. that kind of thing, making drinks for people. And uh, then Somebody's hopefully cooked for six o'clock, and there's a there's a, a group meal at, at six for all the members of the community. Um, that runs till about seven o'clock. Uh, then someone's allotted the duty of washing up. We'll take turns to wash up, and then there's an opportunity in the evening for study, um, for listening to to lectures, for contemplation, with a final meditation at 8.45 in the evening and people are normally tucked up in bed by about 10 mm. o'clock and the point is irrespective of what p people are doing what jobs they've been allocated the task the underlying task the fundamental task is to develop mindfulness in all aspects of one's day from the moment one gets up to the moment one goes to bed not in one chunk mm. you break it up <laughs> but the idea is you keep on setting up the conditions for mindfulness again and again and again and again and you're using I mean some of my favorite jobs when I was a recluse were things like um, sweeping out the front or cleaning the doors of a morning they were such simple tasks and I could practice body mindfulness yeah. so the task of course the task is to be impeccable to make keep the center looking neat and tidy and clean and make sure that it runs effectively and the best way you can do that is to do it as mindfully as you possibly can. So um, I found that was a tremendous fillip that really helps with my ability to see my cravings and you know, irritations. And I mean, it's, it's not a blissful. <laughs> it's, there are ups and downs with it. Sometimes you just really don't feel like doing X, Y, or Z, and you have to because mm. that's the condition of the recluseship. And so you're irritable. You know, you're clunking about, and you're, but eventually you start to see that, and you see that actually that's a terrible burden. And I'm a lot happier if I just acknowledge the irritation, watch it pass. Mm -hmm. And that is that process is enabled through practicing body mindfulness, essentially. Yeah. So, so yes, yeah, so there's a great emphasis on impeccability, doing things in the right way, in order to help develop. That mindfulness, but that's that's the basic daily routine of the centre. 
Are you ever instructed to follow concentration meditation techniques, or is it always vipassana? We are primarily bare in sight. Yeah. But there are two exceptions to that, where somebody has to <laughs> develop their concentration because it's sorely missing and, it, and it, they can't really do the insight until they've generated enough concentration. Yeah. So that might be a possibility. But that can be generated, it doesn't have to be pure samatha, it could be through love and kindness meditation. Okay. So. The other is where somebody shows, demonstrates that actually they're really quite good at it. Yeah. In which case, uh, as a teacher, I might encourage them because if someone can muster deep concentration, that increases the power of their insight meditation. Then. Okay. Yeah. And is, is the restrictions on the reading material monks and nuns can look at? Yeah. Yeah. No. Is it just the cannot canonical texts? It's not just texts? canonical right. texts, but it is carefully monitored because it's so easy to go astray. Um, it's so easy to read something in a book that might not necessarily be how we instruct here, yeah. but it might just be, it might feel comfortable for you. So there might be a strong tendency to go against the instruction and just follow your inclinations and, and justify it because you read it in a book. Yeah. <laughs> so, I found that I would read the Orkana books, I would read the Pali Canon a lot. I was especially fond of the comprehensive manual of Abhidhamma, Abhidhamata Sangaha, which uh, I think is a work of genius. Um, beyond that, I can't remember reading much outside of that. Mm. Um, there wasn't really a need. I was very much focused on the way and practicing, and anything else would feel like beside the point. Mm. And again, that's another area where where uh, craving displays itself. There was one monk who, on his, we have a quiet day on a Sunday, so it's a day when we don't have the same routine. People go for for walks. It's beautiful countryside around here. And it and it's it's that very necessary break from the routine every week, and it's very necessary that people have that. So this one particular monk, uh, who's since died, so it's a right to talk about it. He would just so happen to go on his route past news agents where they'd have copies of the newspapers out the front, so he'd be able to read the headlines. And it's all part of the the kind of the life of a monastic, there is that, for some people there is that strong urge to find out what's going on, what else is around, and so, you know, that's part of the learning learning process, and he learned in the end that it just disrupted his, mm. because that's, that's the thing, it dis disrupts your concentration, it disrupts your intent with the reclusive life, it puts, you know, temptation mm. in front of you, and so it's best to avoid those things. Again, that's another aspect of renunciation. Mm. It's just that choice not to put yourself in a position where, you know, maybe you'd be tempted. Yeah. 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 And, and, and how, what, what about contact with sort of uh, relatives? Are you allowed phone calls, letters? Yeah, there's a, there's a rule about, I mean, you, you have to moderate it. Obviously, <laughs> obviously we want people to stay in touch with family and friends. But on the other hand, you know, the other side of the coin is somebody has chosen the life of a recluse. Mm. They've left the worldly life. And to have a lot of contact, well then why did you become mm. a recluse? So it's just, it, because that's another area of attachment, you see, to family. Mm. Um, so it's just keeping it moderate. Um, you know, letters every six weeks, rather than every week, yeah. you know? A letter every week, every six weeks, uh, and not to the same person within a certain time frame. Uh, it, it's just common sense, again, yeah. because it, it, it overly stimulates the mind. You can, after your first six months as a recluse, you can accept invitations out yeah. for the day. Occasionally it's possible to stay overnight, but beyond that, again, you wouldn't really want to because it just diminishes the, yeah. the, you know, the focus on what you've chosen to do. So it's just keeping it moderate, finding yeah. a middle way.
And what happens if uh, you know your mother or father becomes sick? Are you allowed time off to visit them? And oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, we don't. We don't want to. I mean, you're not in a position as a recluse. You're not in a position to look after them. You would have to. You would have to disrobe and go and look yeah. after them. And once you know they're better, then you can come back and ordain again. You can ordain up to seven times in one lifetime. So. Okay. But. Uh, as a recluse, yeah, you can't be in a position to to look after them. But absolutely, yeah, mm. we would you know, be somewhat cruel and uncompassionate not to, wouldn't it? But but it's got again, it's got to be moderate. It's, it's the, the recluse has to understand that now I've I've left the world. I can go and see them. I can mm. you know, show my my care for them. But then I've chosen this lifetime, this lifestyle. I'm going to commit to that. I mean, just, just, I mean, what, one of the um, comments I've received about uh, monks is that monks and nuns is they're selfish. Um, what's your view on that? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're going to ask me why now? <laughs> well, no, because the whole point of the Buddha's teaching is to give up selfishness. The whole training is geared around giving up selfishness. When you come in, you go, all right, so if there's something that needs doing and you ask me to do it, I do it. Mm. So it's service. It's a life of service. It's a life. I mean, in, in the traditional uh, Buddhist countries, like Thailand, for instance, the monks don't work as such. They wouldn't be gardening, they wouldn't be cooking, mm. and, and so forth. That's an adaptation that, that Alan and Jackie brought in because it's a brilliant way of letting go of self-concern, of giving up. But what the people in, the, in those traditional countries will do is they'll do the births, the marriages, the deaths, you know, they will do the ceremonial, mm. religious um, aspects of Buddhism, which here we, we, don't, we don't go in for, we're mm. not, you know, um, you know, we're not priests. No. But they, in those traditional countries, they fulfil that, that, that purpose. So they work in that respect. They, they serve their community. Mm. Um, the act of meditation itself is not selfish. It is to observe selfish preoccupations and bring them to an end. Yeah? The daydream, the worry, the irritation, whatever it might be. So it is, a, it is a, the polar opposite. To meditate is not a selfish undertaking at all, if it's done being done properly. Mm. I'm not saying that everyone who meditates is meditating in the right way, but definitely here it's being taught in a way the whole emphasis of the training is to transcend the illusory sense of separation. And therefore it is letting go of self-concern. Mm. I, th I think the difficulty is is that it it takes a fair amount of spiritual maturity and wise reflection to come to appreciate what selfishness really is. And I think for a lot of people, they just see the the appearance of things. They just see the superficial appearance of things and say well he's just sh shutting himself off yeah. closing his eyes he's not taking part he's being he's therefore being selfish mm. but it's it, you can never not be a part of life I suppose in our in our culture the people who are seen to be helping the homeless or um, you know working for charities um, doing mm. good in the world they're there what about what about uh, Making someone a cup of tea who's who's come to see the teacher mm. is that is that not generosity is that not service is that not giving is that not included is sweeping up to make sure that the, the place looks nice is that not the mm. same kind of thing it is is not cooking a meal for people on retreat so that they can focus on their meditation is do you see what I mean? It's, yeah. uh, it's, 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 just, it's just that people don't recognise it. That's all yeah. it is. Yeah. I, I suppose it's this view that if, if you help a lot of people, you help someone who's obviously suffering, you're doing better, you're doing a bigger... We are helping uh, people who are obviously suffering. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the thing. Yeah. yeah. 
and and maybe people again it's this thing of people not really truly understanding how fundamental suffering is yeah it's universal really. absolutely it's universal so. and you know i'm in a privileged position as a teacher to talk to the person underneath the appearance of things on, on many many occasions and i know that people suffer mm. i know they suffer a lot and so you know by teaching people meditation by showing them how they can start to look at the processes of mind that are causing the problem, mm. the true problem, that is service to others, that is helping people mm. who suffer. And if somebody in an ancillary position are doing things that enable the teacher to do his or her job to help people who are suffering, they too are helping people who are suffering. Yeah. So, so there is this lovely reciprocal arrangement where the members of the full-time community, the monks, the nuns, the full-time students, the teacher, are um, enabling the lay community to learn about suffering, the causes of suffering and how to let go of suffering. Mm. The lay community in return offer the material support that enables the, the full-time community to operate and, and run. So it's this this mutual virtuous mm. um, circle in operation, and I think really what it comes down to is that people don't understand the Buddha's teaching, and that's why they fall into the error of thinking that somehow there's something selfish going on. Mm. They don't really understand the teaching. Yeah.